And my name is Robin Sullivan. If you need to find me in the UB directory, look me up under Roberta. Robin is a nickname, but please, that's what everybody calls me. I'm a teaching and learning strategist with the education services team, part of the University at Buffalo Libraries. And my email is up on the screen. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. Erin, uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks. Uh, my name is Erin Rowley. I am the head of science and engineering library services for the UB libraries. I'm also the engineering librarian. So for um, anyone in the School of Engineering um, outside of computer science, I am your subject librarian. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about subject librarians in just a bit. Great. So we have um, a very quick poll. We just wanted to get a little bit of um, a little bit of your um, background. We want to know who we're talking to. If you have ever been enrolled in an online course prior to uh, COVID, um, I will open up a poll here and launch it. So you should see on your screen a question. Um, and so if you could just take a second to reply. Um, have you ever been enrolled in an online course before COVID? Uh, I think if everybody would answer that now, I would think that almost everybody at UB probably has some kind of an online responsibility. So we have a good number of you have responded. I am going to end the poll and share those results. So it's almost evenly divided, but uh, just a little bit more have had an online course. So that's great. That'll give you kind of a leg up um, in the coming semester. And um, thank you very much for responding to that poll. So um, as we're going through the session, please feel free um, to ask questions as we're going along. Erin and I will both be trying to man the chat. And um, if any questions come up in the chat that we can't answer um, through the chat, we can stop and take, you know, take the questions as they come. Uh, feel free to also use the raised hand icon that is available if you open up your participants list, you'll see your name, and then right at the bottom of that, there's a <clears throat> more icon that will allow you to raise your hand. Um, so some of the things that we're going to talk about um, in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about how online classes are different than traditional face-to-face -face learning. Um, Aaron is going to talk a lot about the library services that are available and how they might have changed now that we are um, in a, a large part in online functionality. And then I'm going to come back and I'll share some additional tips for being successful in an online environment. And we will also hope that many of you can share tips with each other about how to be a successful online learner. So the first topic we're going to talk about are how online courses are different. Um, in a traditional classroom, you have, um, you know, normally you're all sitting there and the instructor is often um, in the front of the room. In an online environment, there's a couple different terms that you should become familiar with. Uh, one of the terms that describes an online class is asynchronous. And what that means is that all of the learners, all the students are logging into the course at different times. Um, there's not a set time of day that you need to be online. Um, you can do this on your own schedule as your time permits. In a synchronous environment, a synchronous environment just means that everybody is learning at the same time. Um, there is a set schedule. You have to be online, at, you know, Monday and Wednesday at a certain time. Keep in mind that in, you know, online learning, students can be located all over the world. And we have students that are taking classes internationally. Some of them are in international settings. So when you're setting up group meetings or um, just, you know, trying to arrange conversations, make sure you're aware of the different time zones that the people are coming from that will be in that synchronous course. Um, a couple other terms that you might hear is hybrid and high flex. Um, these 
mainly mean that it's a combination of either in-class instruction or synchronous and asynchronous. Many courses nowadays have some kind of mix. The high flex environment is probably the newest term that's getting thrown around in online learning. And one feature usually designates a high flex course, and that usually means giving the students choice. In um, UB, some of the high flex classes will allow the students to determine whether or not they come to class in person or if you take the class online, or if you just join in asynchronously when your time allows. Make sure that you're clear with your instructor and with the syllabus what type of method your class is following. Um, sometimes there's uh, courses that have uh, some people meet online some days a week and some people meet in person other days, and that might change. Right now we're all doing something new and so just be clear with each individual class that you know how that course is going to run. Another thing we wanted to do is we wanted to dispel some of the myths around online learning. I think in the past many people would say, oh, online courses, they're easier, so much easier. You don't have to be there at the same time. And the instructor, it's so much easier for the instructor. That's definitely not the case. Um, in an online course, it can be much more difficult because the motivation um, is all on the learner. Um, you don't have your instructor there guiding you every second of the way. And also an, a learner in an online course has to develop de much more detailed time management skills. These are very important. We'll talk about some strategies that you can use as we go forward um, in this presentation. Um, a lot of people say, well, the online courses are easier than those in-person courses. That's not the case. Every course at UB has a standard curriculum, and all of the same goals and objectives have to be met, whether the course is being offered in person or online. Um, a question that often comes up is if you must have broadband internet in order to participate in an online course. Well, generally, yes, it is very helpful to have reliable internet access. Um, you know, courses that are being offered online may, may have a lot of video involved. And so um, you, in order to play video well through a computer, you do have to have a pretty good internet access. Keep in mind that, um, you know, wireless is very prevalent nowadays, but sometimes just using a cable to connect your computer to your wireless router will make your signal much better. So if you're having a hard time watching the videos, try to find an Ethernet cable and get plugged in. Um, that'll help. And also be clear, um, your instructor should, um, you know, provide the content in all different types of formats so that you can understand everything that you need to know to pass the course. But if you are having difficulties, make sure to let your instructor know. And um, you know, just a couple of tips. Earbuds are often very helpful. Um, especially if you're in a place where you're going to have people or pets or something else that are in the background. Um, earbuds will block that external noise from coming through the web meeting. Uh, if you're not speaking, it's a good idea to mute your mic. And um, to, to help develop community, it's a good idea to share your image um, through your uh, Zoom or WebEx profile. And even better, if you have the opportunity to share your video. Some instructors may require you to do that at certain points. And um, so again, be clear about what your instructor wants as far as their policies for the course. Um, the final tip on this screen I want to share is keep in mind, use a phone if necessary. Sometimes some microphones will not be the best feed for your audio. And, uh, or sometimes you just may not be near a computer. You can use a landline to connect to almost any web conferencing meeting. Um, so keep in mind that that's a still a great technology and it's available for you. Um, sometimes you can have your computer screen connected through the web conference so you can see the shared visuals, but yet also connect using a phone line. 
for the audio channel. Um, and also um, a point on this screen is a list of netiquette tips. And so um, you can click on those and, you know, just some of these same ideas that we're sharing um, just elaborated on. So the way you access an online course is through, at UB, you go through the UB Learns course management system. At UB, we have Blackboard as the system that runs our learning management system. And the best way to access it is to go to the MyUB page at myub.buffalo.edu. And at the top of the screen, there's a link to UB Learns. From there, you can click on the links to get to your different classes. There is um, a lot of research that shows that if you're an active learner, you're more likely to retain the information that you're learning as compared to being a passive learner. So if you can interact, ask questions, share comments with your fellow learners, uh, create a learning community and you know, make connections to your classmates, that will help you succeed in an online course. So some uh, time management tips, be organized and make a schedule. Um, I'll show you a, a schematic that you can use to document the time that you're in an online class and the time that you need for other personal tasks. Um, break up your tasks. Try, try not to cram all of your schoolwork into one or two days. Try to break it up and do a little bit each day. Chunk things up. It makes it much more easier to accomplish than trying to say, oh, okay, I need to do this all now, all at once. And it's very important to know your support structure. Connect with your faculty, connect with the teaching assistants, your fellow students, also your librarians. Erin um, is going to introduce you to the library team that you have that is at your beck and call. Um, so for time management, you want to make sure that you prioritize and organize everything that's on your calendar. Take a calendar format and block out, make yourself a calendar and try to stick with it. Write down on that calendar what times you might need to be at your work if you do have an uh, employment opportunity. Write down block out time for dinner and for lunch um, and then put in times that you'll be in class, time, blackout time for um, any sports activities, and also write down homework. So this kind of um, calendar structure will help you keep on time and keep to the tasks that are important to you. Don't procrastinate. It's human nature. Many of us wait until the last minute, including instructors and staff, but if you have um, some homework that's due, don't wait until 1130 at night to ask your instructor a question. They will try to make it clear to you when they are, you know, what's the window that they will be responding. Um, but don't wait until the last minute before you reach out. So a question is, what kind of time commitment is expected? So it's a good idea to log in a couple of times a day, um, but that's not always possible. Um, if you can log in a few times a week, maybe four times a week, that will help you keep up on, on your coursework, keep up with the activities. Um, again, try not to just lump it all into you know, one or two times. This credit formula, is it, it go, it, this follows whether you're in a traditional class or an online class. Um, the credit hour, for each credit hour that you're taking, you should expect to do two extra hours of work. So you're in class for a single credit hour course, that's one hour, and then two extra hours for homework. So if you take a three credit hour class, that averages out to about nine hours for each course. If you're taking a typical course load of about four courses, that could mean, that should mean that your class should take at least 36 hours each week. 
So keeping that in mind, if you have to have another full-time job, you need time in there to sleep and do all of your other activities. It's a pretty good formula to follow. We do want to share some additional resources. Since you've made the time to participate in this webinar, we know that you're one of the students that wants to succeed. This online course was created by some of the UB faculty members, in addition to other faculty. Um, and it's an online um, course that you can enroll in in UB Learns. So if you just go into the UB Learn screen, into the catalog, and search for the terms I succeed, the course will come up and will allow you to self-enroll. There are other lessons in here that have um, little self-quizzes. Nobody gets the grade except for you um, on time management, setting goals, um, interaction and diversity. Also on, you know, what's your learning style? How do you learn best? And it'll teach you additional strategies beyond what we can do in just this short one-hour time slot. So those are just a few tips. I'm going to turn it over to Erin, who is going to talk to you about the library's website. And Erin, are you able to share, or do I need to stop? Oh, um, yeah, once you stop, I should be able to. Okay. All right. There we go. Great. Um, so, as uh, Robin mentioned, uh, I'm going to be sharing some information about library resources. Um, just in case you didn't hear at the beginning, uh, my name is Erin Rowley. I'm the engineering librarian here at UB. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about subject librarians and the librarians that are here to help you. Um, but first and foremost, uh, if you can see my screen, which hopefully you can, um, I'm sharing uh, my browser, which is uh, on the library's homepage, library.buffalo.edu. If you have not been to this website ever before, um, now would be the time to check it out, especially if you're, if you're learning remotely. But really, in any case, even before COVID, I would always say this is a good time to visit it. It's also a good web page to bookmark so you can easily and quickly access it. Um, and I know that sometimes, especially early on in the semester, if I'm invited into a course, some students might even wonder why, why they need to know about the libraries just yet. And so you might not need to use library resources just yet, but if you have an assignment that's coming up, um, it, you know, for midterms at the end of the semester, if it says anything about having uh, resource or sources for a paper or maybe for a presentation, especially if it's a scholarly, peer-reviewed, refereed. This is uh, this is the type of information you really want to come to the library website for, as opposed to Google. You don't go to Google if you're looking for only scholarly resources. Is everything on Google Google garbage? Of course not. There's lots of great information available through Google. But if you want resources that you are credible, reliable resources, especially scholarly, this is where you want to come first. So that's all well and good. How do you actually get to the information? I'm not going to be doing a deep dive into anything today, um, just sort of skimming the surface, if you will. Um, but the first thing I'd like to point out um, before we talk about getting to the information is just some extra information um, that's available to you, especially during this time with COVID. Uh, anytime we have anything to communicate from the libraries, you're going to see it up here in this uh, carousel, this banner bar that's constantly rotating. I'm going to go back here to this teal colored uh, image here with the COVID-19 update. Um, if you click on that link, it will take you to our special news release, uh, especially related to fall 2020 semester. So the library hours, um, anything related to resources, services that are changed due to COVID, all of that is right here. Um, you'll see it's been last updated September 1st. If anything changes um, in terms of what's happening on campus, um, the information here will be updated. So you can always come to this particular page. Um, you can see quickly, you can get information on hours, information on borrowing and delivery of library materials, including returning library materials. If you had something out from last semester and you're wondering if you have to return it, you can if you like. We do have drop boxes, um, but if you're still using it, you can you can hold on to it. Um, we have overdue fines have been tempor temporarily waived just because of COVID-19. So all of that is really available for you here. Um, just wanted to point that out. 
we come back here now. Um, I'm going to focus on actually getting to some of the content that we have, especially if you're learning remotely or working remotely and you need access to information. We have what we call the everything search. And the everything search is intended to be a Google-like experience for you. Of course, with library-related information, not Google, but Google-like in that it's searching not just books. We're talking about more than just the print books that are on the shelf available to you. Um, we're talking about eBooks. We're talking about newspaper articles, journals, scholarly articles, data sets, multimedia, and more available through this search. So you can search this like you would any sort of search engine or database. You can absolutely search by topic. If you are given the title of a book or an article to find, drop that whole title directly in this box. Don't try to topic search it in that case. If you have the title, just search the title. But if we were going to search something like, this is might be a little too on the nose, but we're going to search pandemic. <laughs> Maybe with everything going on, you're, a little, you're interested to know what other types of information we have. And maybe most often when I show um, the everything search, I might throw in a more than just one particular term for a topic, but it seemed, uh, seemed to be a good example in this particular case. So just by searching the term pandemic, quick note here, uh, there should always be some more information here on the left-hand side. For some reason, I'm having some issues, at least on my machine, where it's not always loading on the first go. If you just see this information on your own machine, you don't see anything else beyond the sort by, reload it that's that's the that's the trick um reload that and now you should get some more choices here because there we go <laughs> um now we'll see um because i say this because if you notice up at the top of the search results if you can see where i've highlighted with my mouse we have 1.6 million results 1.6 plus actually that's a lot of information um so i won't ever expect you to go through all that i wouldn't go through all that so the reason why I wanted this left-hand column to show up here is that it got, gives some really great ways to narrow your search. If you need to, to narrow to just those peer-reviewed articles um, for a paper, if it says find five, cite 10 of them, this is a really quick one-click way to narrow your search to just those peer-reviewed articles. So you can also um, narrow to things that are just available online. If you are not on campus and cannot come to campus, you don't want to print books, you don't need a DVD in, in, in physical form, you just want online only materials, again, one click quick, one click quick, easy for me to say, and then you can get access to that. Um, you can also narrow by content type, you can narrow by date, subject, there's some other things there, but I also thought I would point out just a few things here in terms of accessing the information. When you run this search, you will see above the title of each item, it will tell you what it is, a book or ebook. in this case for, for result number one, same with number two. If we get down to the third one, we can see it's an article. In all three cases for the first three, it says available online, and that's great. So you can easily get access to that by clicking on the link to available online. It will open up this sort of overlay screen, if you will, and you would click on this database. So anywhere, you would always bring you to this view online section, click on the database, and it should take you directly into the resource. You might hit a UBIT login page. That's totally okay. In this case, I've already logged in once or twice earlier today, so it just brought me right in. But if you hit the UBIT log, uh, login page, be sure to, um, to, to log in with your credentials, authenticate with Duo if you need to. But it will bring you right here and you can read this book online. It looks like you can get a Kindle version or there's an EPUB version where you can maybe download it as a PDF. Um, every vendor that we use for eBooks, and it's more than just one or two, we have several vendors for eBooks are a little bit different. So if you don't see that exact kind of screen for your own eBook that you happen to be trying to view, just look around on the screen to see where you can either view it on, in the screen to, to read it, or if you can download it, maybe you can only download a chapter at a time as opposed to the whole book. All of them have slightly different access um, information. I'm just gonna scroll down here a little bit because I thought I'd also point out in case number four is a book and it says available, but not online. This is the case of a print book, so it's not available electronically. It is available in print. And I can tell that because it says it's available at Lockwood Library will always tell you the library or location where it's located. And then these numbers, or letters and numbers in parentheses after the actual library location, 
those are the call number, or that's the location information. So you can actually find that specific book on the shelf. You don't have to go to Lockwood and wander around all five, six floors to find the book. Follow the signs. There will be signs to say which call numbers are on which floors. We always start with letters. So you'd find where are the P's. Go to that floor, um, floor four, I believe, and you would find that book on the shelf there. All right. I'm going to go back here really quickly. Wrap up my piece here. Um, Aaron, so actually, yeah. um, we had a question about um, getting the physical copy of the book if it was published uh, a while ago and doesn't have an ebook format. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so, if there is a print book, there is no electronic copy. If you need access to that particular book, um, if you can't come to Lockwood, so here's that here's that information where you can physically walk into Lockwood yourself, pull it off the shelf. But let's say you're across the country, even across the straight the state, and you can't come in, you can't get access to it. We can still get you that resource, especially during COVID. Um, Normally, we just say, you know, you'd have to come into come into the library and get that um, and, and, and access it that way. But in this case, if you are learning remotely from home for 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 this semester, or for this for the whole academic year, by clicking on that title of the book, it brought up that overlay screen again here on my screen. And under the get it section, we have that location information. But above that, you can request it using Delivery Plus. Delivery Plus is a completely free service. Uh, it is our document delivery and interlibrary loan service. So for things that we don't own and we need to borrow from other libraries, we can do that. If we do have it, like in this case, but you need it sent home, you can click on that Delivery Plus book request. It pops up this little form here. You can check pick up location. And then if you see here, personal delivery, either permanent or local. Now keep in mind, this is information on, on hand with the registrar. So whatever is, is on file with the registrar, that is where it's going to be delivered. Um, so keep that in mind. If your permanent address with the registrar is not correct, not where you want it to go, you need to update it with the registrar first. So we don't have access, we have access to that information, but we can't necessarily change it. If you have questions about that, I will come back at the end. Um, like if you personally have a question about about the personal delivery, where it's getting, I'm gonna show you how you can contact us um, uh, later on. So if this comes up later and you have a question, um, we're not on the live webinar and you have, you need some information, I'm gonna show you how you can get some answers. So there are options you can, if you are on campus, you can change, you can, you can select, you know, Lockwood, Abbott on South Campus, but there's also personal delivery um, available as well. Again, this is due to COVID. So, um, and then you would just fill out that form and you would click send request. I'm not going to do that because otherwise they will send it to me. So I will close that out. But thanks. Great question. Was there anything else? I noticed the chat pop up a couple times. No, that was it. That was perfect. Thank you. Great. In terms of access to something else to re that's really important to keep in mind, especially if you're off campus. If you're on campus, you might notice, like if you've ever been on campus and using library materials, you might notice you haven't had to do very much. Maybe throw in a UBIT name and password but it's been pretty easy because you're connected to the university Wi-Fi, right? But if you are home off campus, it's really important to know that you do not want to be connected to the VPN. I know it almost sounds counterintuitive to say it out loud like that, but you do not want to be connected to the VPN to access library resources like the databases, which includes eBooks. So anything like that, make sure you're disconnected from the VPN. Any other issues in terms of accessing things, we have under the Find Materials menu option back on the main library page, Off-Campus Access, you click on that. And there's all sorts of information here, including the proxy server bookmarklets that you can add to your browser if you need to, to sort of help things along. If you try all these things, you come here, the VPN is not connected, you are still having issues, please, please come and tell us. Um, sometimes it's an issue that more, more than one person is having and you just happen to be the person that tells us and that's important. So we might not know until you tell us. So never hesitate to contact us with that. The last thing I'm going to go over quickly before I'm going to pass it back to Robin and before I show you how you can get in touch with this, I keep telling you to contact us and I'll show you how in just a second. But the first thing I want to show you is under this research help area. Uh, the very first option is research guides. And I point this out because maybe you need some very specific resources to your subject area, whether that be engineering, whether it be computer science, education I saw come up in when everybody was introducing themselves. 
to all of the different subject areas that are covered in UB, and we're a big school, so there's a lot, they're all listed out here. All of our subject librarians, like I mentioned earlier, I'm the engineering librarian. There's other librarians for other subjects. They're all listed here. So if we scroll down, I'm going to point out computer science because, as I mentioned earlier, I am your contact, um, your, your, your official <laughs> uh, subject librarian for engineering. Everything except computer science, computer engineering. And that's because we have a separate computer science librarian. So there's a se separate computer science guide here. You can click on that. Not only will it give you resources specifically for computer science that might be good to try for your research purposes, we also have contact information. So there'll be contact information for all of those guides for the specific subject librarian that you might want to contact if you have further questions. So Jill is our computer science librarian. You can see you can email her, her phone number, her email address, all right there so you can easily access it. Now, if you're not really sure, maybe you just need immediate help, you don't want to send an email, um, you can always contact us a bunch of different ways under this Ask a Librarian area of the menu, last menu option on the right here. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways. You can see there's email, so there's a gener generic email that you can contact us as well. Phone numbers, um, in person, I'm going to click on that. I know that, that not, not all of us are in person right now given this time, but if you click on in person, you can get the full subject list if you just want to see it by subject. Um, you don't want to go into any of those guides. That's where it lives. You can see all of the subject areas here alphabetically with the librarian listed on the right-hand side. But if you, if it's 11 p.m., you know, 2 a.m., I'm probably not online at 2 a.m. myself personally, but you can still get in touch with a librarian, and that's through our chat and text service. Chat and text are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and you will get a real live librarian on the other end of the line here. There's somebody here right now. I will not send them a question, so I won't freak them out. Um, so, um, but there is somebody there that can help you. You're, you're stuck. You don't know what terms to search. You don't know what database to search. You just don't know where to go. Maybe you don't know where to start. You get stuck along the way. Maybe there's an issue accessing full text for something that you think we should have full text for. This is where you want to go. Come here. You can get, like it says, in an instant librarian. So absolutely check that out. But that is what I wanted to share in terms of the library website today. Were there any other questions that I can help to answer in terms of the website or accessing information before I stop sharing my screen? Um, there is one question. Um, so the question is, if you're in com computer engineering, do you use yeah. the computer science guide or the engineering guide? That's a great question. I'm um, going back over that. I mean, computer science is still a great place is, is, is a great resource to use. It's a great research guide. If, if you wanted to check out some of the enge other engineering guides, you are more than welcome to do that. They are not restricted to just um, other engineering majors. If you come down to engineering and click on that, you'll notice that I do focus the guides on the various other departments that exist. But maybe you have a slant, you know, that you overlap with mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, and you want to see what sort of resources are available there, by all means, please please do. So they're there for you. That's exactly what they're there for you. But you'll notice that there'll probably be some overlap between all of these guides, whether it's between computer science and various engineering departments, or just from one engineering department to the next of electrical versus mechanical, because there's some really good general resources when it comes to engineering research information, like Engineering Village, great research tool. Computer science is included in there, electrical engineering, all the engineering areas, including things like engineering education, um, engineering management, great resource. So absolutely check it out if you want. There's more information on those pages as well, including on like patents and technical reports, standards, things that you may need. But if you ever have a question, um, feel free to reach out to me as well. You can contact Jill um, or me. Um, doesn't no right answer, but just like to point you to you know the people that exist. So um, or contact us both. We don't, we're always happy to do that. Great. Great. Thank I'm gonna stop much sharing much. my. Oh yeah, absolutely. Great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so please, you know, definitely connect with Erin and any of the other librarians. Um, you know, look up your subject specialist and they would be happy to talk with you and help you through any questions that you might have. So we have just a few more tips about being an online learner or a successful learner in this upcoming uh, strange semester. And so we'll get going and we will still have time at the end to, to 
talk about more questions that you might have. So um, the, this is the wonderful team of science librarians that are out there, and it's only just a portion of uh, who we have that are available to help at the UB libraries, and um, you will see some of their friendly faces if you go through, or you can chat and talk with them through text, email, or phone, or you can even arrange video conferences um, with this new regular communication that we now have. Um, so, um, communication in an online course or in a partially online course, a lot of it is going to be text-based. So make sure that you read and follow all of the instructions. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to pay attention to. But um, when you have an assignment, read everything twice. If you still don't understand, certainly reach out to whoever you have, um, either a TA or your faculty or faculty advisor, and they would be happy to um, help you understand what it is that you're confused about. Um, communicating with your professors and teaching assistants, academic advisors, in a traditional course, you can, you know, kind of just look confused and they will say, oh, you know, did you have a question um, or you raise your hand. In an online course, there are many different ways to communicate. You have um, messaging that's available through UB Learns, um, email. Um, you can also set up web conferences with your instructor, with your um, academic advisor. So um, keep in mind that's just a little different. Uh, those tiny little squares are really hard to make out when someone has a question. So make sure you, you know, wave yourself, your hand physically in your window. Use the raise your hand icon in the participant window. Um, and also just ask questions in the chat. A lot of times, if the faculty member is the only person that is in there leading the room, they may not always see questions that run through the chat. So sometimes it's a good idea for um, a student in a course to volunteer themselves as the voice of the chat. Just kind of like Aaron and I are kind of watching the chat as it's going through when the other one's presenting. We don't have that chat window right on our main screen. It's kind of, we're lucky we have second screens. Um, but so, keep in mind that sometimes those messages will squeeze through. Um, so other ways um, communicating in an online course, a lot of times faculty will be creating video lectures. Um, you can watch those. What's great about an online lecture as compared to when you're in a traditional lecture hall, you can, in a lecture hall, just rewind your instructor. If you're watching a video lecture, you can easily say, what did they say? And you can rewind it and rewatch that section as many times as you need to to understand what the content is trying to get across. Um, in an online course, we are now, Zoom is, uh, it, it's now a verb. It started out just to be the name of a company. Now everybody, just like Google, used to be just the name of a company. It's now a recognized verb. Um, I don't know if Zoom has the recognized factor, but we, st we all use, I'm going to Zoom call you. Um, so there's, uh, Zoom is a un enterprise supported tool. All students have full access to it. You can um, set up your own Zoom meetings. WebEx is the same. And there are also other tools out there, like uh, Google Meet, and just too many to mention in this short amount of time. But this is how people are meeting and um, socializing uh, in today's day and age. In an online course, uh, another way that you'll communicate is through discussion boards. Not all classes use discussion boards, but those that do, it can be a very worthwhile way to share your thoughts and ideas with others. Um, make sure that you participate, and um, as you're writing out your discussion forum post, a big tip I'm going to give you is to use a separate word processing software, especially if you're typing out more than just a few words. It happens a lot that if you're typing in a discussion forum and you uh, have all your thoughts perfectly composed and then you go to hit the send button and you accidentally hit the close window button, all of your great text is lost. So if you compose it in something else, you can check all of your grammar, make sure that's right. You can even save your work and go back an hour or so later and say, is that really saying what I tried to say? And so it's a good idea to try to compose your discussion forum posts in a separate software. Um, avoid strong language when you're communicating online. 
um, if you're using caps, that's similar to just yelling your response. So keep in mind that, um, you know, using caps is not great unless you're really trying to make something important. Um, sarcasm does not come out well when you try to type it. You can't put that inflection in your voice that says, yeah, I'm just kidding, or um, others can't see your facial expressions as well. I once um, was on a project with somebody, met with them online for an entire year, and I had was at a conference uh, following, you know, a year after we had worked together. I didn't even realize that she was sitting right behind me because I couldn't recognize her from that tiny little square. Um, I would like to mention that try to put a, a image of yourself in your Zoom profile that is so helpful to be able to associate people with, with, with what they're saying in course. Even uh, Daisy, thank you so much for including those beautiful roses in your profile picture. When you then will communicate, other people will be able to say, oh yeah, that was Daisy who said it. Even if they didn't read your name on the screen, they can see those visuals. Be a reflective student. So what that means is just being a person that thinks about your thinking. So there's research out there that says if you are a reflective thinker, if you read a chapter and then you just stop for a few minutes and try to think to yourself, what is it that I just read? What's important in that chapter to me or what's important in that lesson? That will help you be a successful, successful student. Um, we also have some technology tips um, that we want to share. So there are millions and millions of technology tools that are out there. Don't try to experiment with many at one time. Pick a few that you think will be useful for your needs. Um, always have a plan B. So if you're going to be online in class, make sure that you have your phone nearby so that if your microphone happens to not work that day, you can just pick up the phone and connect to the audio channel there. Um, if you have a presentation, make sure you have different ways of sharing that information through that presentation. I have my trusty piece of paper here that if my slides didn't work, I can still tell you what I was going to try to tell you. Um, so we have a plan B in mind, sometimes even many plans. Um, here's a great resource that you might want to check out. This uh, site um, is, uh, the URL is on the screen. It's suny.edu slash mtech. That's E-M-T-E-C-H. And that takes you to the Exploring Emerging Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success website. Um, the website has two components. One component is a MOOC. That just stands for another online course, Massive Open Online Course. It's freely, totally free for everyone within the SUNY system. It was built by UB and faculty and staff from across SUNY. Um, and other people outside of SUNY will have a small charge if they want to get the Coursera certificate for completion. It only takes about five hours to complete the entire course. But the other part of this website is a database of technology tools. They are organized by the objective. So if you need to um, participate in a debate or you need to visualize information, um, it will sh point you to the proper resources. So if you're visualizing information, it will narrow down the 500 different tools to something that will help you communicate through uh, charts or infographics. Um, if you're trying to tell a story, it will point you to how you can create digital videos, um, how you can add captions to those videos. So check out that resource when you get time. Um, there's also a section on there that has essential tools. So just some of the, like, the, the most important ones for doing presentations and some that you'll find that are your university supported toolkit like Zoom and WebEx. Um, these tools are meant to extend the functionality of your learning management systems. You can't easily use UbiLearns to create a video, but if you go to the MTech website, you can find the tools that will allow you to pull in different images. You can find out what Creative Commons is so that you can use images that you're legally able to use. Um, and there's just a lot of resources there. Always make sure never use your campus username and password when you're signing up for accounts through some of these free third-party tools. 
use the you can use your email address but always choose a different password you never want to share that combination out and read what the terms of use are this um, slide shares a nice video about your mental well-being that's as equally important as your academic well-being so make sure to keep up on you know keeping yourself intact um, that video you can watch on your own time where, um, you know, I don't want to take time out here. Um, but let's just review some of the things that we talked about. Um, we talked about how online and traditional learning is a little bit different. Uh, active learners are, they perform best in both online and traditional environments. We talked about being effective in your time management tr strategies. And we also talked about, you know, how often it's useful to log in to, an, to a course per week. And probably the most important thing we want you to get out of this the whole presentation is that your UB librarians are here to help. So make sure to ask your librarian, um, whoever that might be, and they will help you through anything that you're, you're struggling with that relates to the UB libraries. Um, again, we want to share some links that you can refer to afterwards. We will make sure this and the recording goes out after this session is done. We'll probably get it out in the next day or two. And we want to end this by asking if you have any tips for success that you want to share with your fellow um, learners on the call here. We're going to invite you all to unmute yourself and share some comments. Um, and on, while you're thinking about something you might want to share with others, I just want to share, this is one of the wonderful library student assistants that we have. Her name is Nicole, and she's going to give a little tip to all of you um, what she thinks about being an online learner. Oops, stop. Try that again. Hi, my name is Nicole, and I'm a senior political science and business administration major at the University of Buffalo. While COVID-19 has changed the way a lot of classes will be delivered, I found there's a lot of benefit to taking online classes. For instance, online classes have given me the flexibility to learn at my own pace in an environment that's comfortable for me. In addition, many professors will provide lecture recordings that are easy to go back and review. All these factors have allowed me to engage with course content on a deeper level. I hope you're able to find the benefits of online learning like I have, and I hope you have a great semester. Great. So Aaron and I want to thank you all for your time. Um, and we do want to ask you to possibly unmute. And um, if you if uh, if you have some questions, you can either ask them, um, you know, just unmute yourself and ask or feel free to add them in the chat. So um, does anybody have any questions or comments or tips to share? We would love to hear from you. And for those of you that have been an online student before, what worked best for you to, you know, to kind of get your time management skills down or um, finding proper resources at the libraries? Do you have any ideas to share about that? Looks like we have somebody in the chat that said, um, regarding time management, I think sometimes it is difficult to estimate how long each task will take. What should I do? That's a great question. <laughs> in terms of estimating, it is hard to do. I, I agree. That's a, I think that's a universal problem. <laughs> yes, there actually there are some uh, websites out there that um, have kind of estimators. Um, time on task estimators. I know that I've referred um, some faculty as they're designing activities. Um, I will don't have those links off the top of my head, but I will try to find the thing that I'm thinking about um, that says if you have, um, you know, there, there's something that I've used in the past that I can paste in the text and it says, okay, this should take you about 20 minutes to read 
or um, so you know try to find you know you might even go into the mtech wiki and do a search in there for uh, time management go to that I succeed website um, I'm going to go back a few to there to find that link there it is um, so this is uh, one too many there we go so this I succeed course has a lot of um, uh, content about developing time management strategies it will also provide some little testing opportunities so that you can test yourself on time management skills um, but it is you know kind of difficult if you know use that formula I think that was like one screen over yeah, use this formula to say, okay, I have a single credit hour, I have a three credit hour course, so I need to block out nine hours a week for that course. Um, and then you'll just have to kind of play it by ear on some of those other things. Um, sorry, I don't have a more concrete answer there, but I'll try to share a link in the email that goes out. Did you have any specific question about that? Um, You look at no. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I uh, sometimes even just book, like booking myself for an hour, even if I don't know if that's going to be enough time. Sometimes it's just sectioning off some time and um, and getting as much done as you can. I find that even now, after years of being in school and working, like I'm still learning how long it takes me to do things. But sometimes my biggest challenge is like setting the time aside to do really devote to doing the task because. A lot of times I think I can just sort of fit it in. Like I have, I have, I have, I have meetings, I have calls, I've got classes I'm in, and then oh, I've got, you know, 20 minutes there, I'll be able to fit it in. But I don't until I really go into my calendar, like Robin suggested earlier, and block off my time. And then I have, and then I know, like, even if I don't get it done in this hour, this hour is just for that task, whether it's researching, reading through articles I've found, what have, making a recording, something like that. Yeah. So sometimes that's, until you maybe start to learn how how long things are going to take, or if you're using the calculator, sometimes you make sure to always block off that time too. And also, um, you know, technology is a great thing. Everything's got a little, um, you know, there's timers on your phone so that like when we're in sessions like this, it's like, okay, we have two minutes left. <laughs> um, so, you know, use those types of, um, you know, there are, um, timers that will allow you to turn off all your social media for an hour so that you concentrate on the task at hand. Um, and others that say, okay, it's been an hour and you haven't stepped away from that computer screen. Um, you know, so, you know, find, find the different tools that will help you do what you need to do. So does anybody else have a, a question? Otherwise, I think we will stop the session and say thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, wish you the very best of luck going forward in this semester. And please make sure to look up your subjects um, liaison in the libraries just to say hi and introduce yourself. And if you're new to UB, they will hopefully be here with you throughout your entire career here as a student. So thank you all very much. Yes, thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you for attending. <laughs>